Helen's coming. It's like Christmas. It's like Christmas. It's like you just want to hurry up and burn through your time with me so Helen can get on. I look at this. I got a list. Dude, share your list. Hey, um, I'm Melinda McKenzie. I'm Tom Wise. You're going to unpack some shit with us. And then we have famous comedian Helen Keeney. It's just going to be, I went to the bathroom before I got started because it's going to be a laugh riot. I can't wait. And her favorite color is blue. And her favorite color is blue. We are this not sucking up. We're not sucking up at all. Um, so what do you want to talk about real quick before Helen gets on? All right. I was on, I'm addicted to TikTok. Oh, should I do TikTok? Should I? Would it? And I saw a, a female therapist author on there. Yes. And she's talking about relationships. I, I forgot. I, I favorited her, but I don't know how to get into my favorites. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> she had some interesting things to say about relationships and women. And one was a, oh, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm giving this whole thing up. Three month, no kissing. Tell me why. I've never done that. Have you? Well, here's the deal. And and she makes sense on a certain level. I don't know if it's three months for us at 60, but maybe three months for a girl who's 18. It's okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What you want to do is find out what the guy really wants. Are you a treasure or a target? A treasure or a or target? A target. Shit. If, if he's not willing to wait three months, target. Although... I think we can get to treasure a little bit earlier than three months. I think at our age, maybe one month. It's an interesting thing because it does establish, because I've, I, I mean, I've entered into a, a sexual relationship where I thought it was too soon. Like, no, yeah. no, let's continue to build here. And then you go yeah. to have sex. It's like, yeah, you know, then if it doesn't go great or does go, whatever it, it, it you've, you've lost the foundation of the relationship. My mom I hope I get this saying right. Tell me if the, you probably know the saying. My mom says she won't. Uh, wire, lo, nose is longer than a telephone wire. <laughs> no, the older guys want a purse or a nurse. Is that right? Is that how it goes? I've never heard it, but I think maybe I haven't heard it, but yeah. Because at our age, it's a different kind of. Uh, right. Yeah. It's not like, it's not like you're not really, you know, you pretty much know what a guy like you want my six-year-old body for sex just let me make sure sir <laughs> let me make sure i don't want to pull anything <laughs> let me take would that you, pills would you be interested in hearing from a therapist maybe that has eyes for people our age i would like to know yeah. because i i definitely i've definitely been in relationships one two where it really started to feel like the guy was more interested in my money and what my money could do for the relationship. See, this is how this is how some men feel. Now, some men are very comfortable with buying a woman's affection, but some of them is like, I'd rather be liked for me rather than, yes. you know, let her know that I'm early. I'm a millionaire, but I live like right. a pauper. Yes. I, I had that conversation one time because I drive that old shitty car and I'm, I'm not a millionaire, but I don't do badly, but I drive right. a car that has 300,000 miles on it. Yeah. People climb in there going, is this well, it's because you want to, not because you have to. You, it's, right, but it's an interesting, it's an also an interesting weeding thing. Yeah. It's clean and it gets from A to B. Yeah. Um, People care a lot about cars. It's funny to me because the guys that I've dated always make a big deal about their car. And I have to say, as a female, I've never been super impressed because I feel like any poor person can get a car on a lease. I don't know. $129 that. a month. Right. I don't think it's that it, your car doesn't impress me. So, well, you have a million topics. I know <laughs> Helen's getting ready to get on in five minutes. So what do you want to talk about for five minutes before? I'm our saying, summer? okay, here. Okay. Here's one. I, pro, I propose that you can, it, it's an, I don't, I'm, I propose that you can indicate um, how a woman might be as a sex partner by the way that she eats. If she's presented when she, when she eats in public or when she eats when she's alone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering if there's a tell that a woman looks at a man and says, oh, I can see. Oh, yeah, he's so my 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 test case would be how somebody would handle a plate of ribs versus a man dancing at a wedding. How the man dances at the wedding is how good he is in bed. I'm saying is you have a tell that like, oh yeah, look at the way he, 
uh, you know, handles that shovel or pushes that shopping cart or leans on his something or look at him dancing. He's, oh my God, he's a spastic or he's, <laughs> has interesting rhythm. Interesting. You know, has, have studies shown what we, what we do it because here's here as a chick if i'm at a wedding yeah and a guy that i'm attracted to dances very well on the dance floor i'll give you my honest opinion about what i think please that's what we're here for we're unpacking shit oh don't know okay you want me to give my honest opinion okay so and this is going to show what a hundred shows in you know <laughs> wait a minute what are we about oh, um helen's, in. helen's here go ahead is helen here should Ooh. we get helen's opinion on this bring her in i'll give my opinion then we'll get helen's All okay right. well well real quick just like we do with everybody else we'll let them in and helen i'm in the middle of a dirty joke <laughs> welcome to the show helen keeney are you is your audio on can you hear can we hear you can you hear us i can't hear you yeah one second i can hear I can, you we can hear you we can Helen has a nice mic, everybody. Look at the wow, mic that look Helen at has. Hello. I'm so Hello. jealous. I've got to get myself a mic. I think you right. know, the last, I, I listened to the last two shows. I think the recording's been on my Brio rather than my microphone. Oh, I, I can hear you on the mic. Real quick before she comes back on. If I see a guy that I'm interested in and he's a really good dancer, the first thing that I think is, if he likes all that attention dancing on the dance floor, that he's probably not a good lover because he's more about the attention he gets wow. than how good he. I'm just telling you, that's an honest opinion. I'm probably just a horrible bitch I, by saying that, but that's what I think. What's going on? You're kidding me. So, so what can a guy do? Can he so on the dance floor if you just kind of is it? I, I think if if the guy is attentive and a good dancer with his partner and not a good dancer for he's got a life. partner now. Oh, you so some random woman from the conga line. She's he's dancing. Well, I'm just saying, if a guy is a good dancer and he's not doing it for attention, but he's doing it for the enjoyment of who he's with, I think that gives me a different vibe. Do you know what I mean? All right. Sure. Well, I, so might there be another way that you have a tell that he's a good lover? Yeah. Um, or a certain type of lover. Uh, okay. Here's what I man. Think. You may not want a, a woman that just devours ribs. Maybe you want the one that's you know. Maybe you want the one that cuts the meat off the bone or or licks the barbecue sauce first. That's right. Whatever. You don't, what would you do if you're out on a date and the chick you were with picks up the ribs and starts licking the sauce off the ribs? Would you acknowledge it or would you just let it go? I'd ask for a check. We're getting in the car. <laughs> okay. I Can hear you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sorry. I had just done a podcast a few weeks ago and I have this elaborate setup. So I can see. <laughs> I, Look at you. I didn't push every button. Hey, Hi, Lynn, I, was, I haven't talked to you in ages. It's so good to see you. We're so excited to have you on. Melinda, I'm so excited to see you and your monkey. I can't. <laughs> I don't know which I'm more excited for your monkey. Or you. Did you craft that yourself? Well, this is my travel monkey and it became part of my spiel when I was traveling. And now that I'm working from home, I'm trying to find more ways to get attention. And so this is why. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> Look at me. Look at all my stuff. Yeah, I have nothing back here. Just don't guitar. don't look at me. <laughs> um, so everybody, this is Helen Keeney. We know her from HSN, but the world knows her from being a stand-up comedian. So Helen, share with the world who you are. Well, I want to know actually what you mean by the world. Um, how many people actually listen to this podcast? Is oh, the world please. you and You're your brother? You're about to blow up. You're about to explode. <laughs> we have three regular viewers. Three regular. Say hi to all of them. Could you mind? One is Paula. <laughs> and I have a couple of regular stalkers. We can't let these people down, Helen. I've got a woman I used all to right. date. She thumbs let, down Let me give show. out my home address then. Oh, I would love it. And yes. <laughs> A five for a personal joke. You know, this last year for stand up obviously has been uh, almost non existent. I stopped doing stand up in March. Uh, and then in November, I decided that personally the pandemic was over for really? some reason. Yeah. Yeah. I've had it. And then I did a whole month of gigs. I did some theaters and oh. I convinced myself that it, it's gone on too long and I was done with it. 
Uh-huh. And then I realized that it was a giant mistake and that pe- it was not over. And then I stopped again until I'm going back to work on April 7th, 16th and 17th for McCurdy's in Sarasota. Yeah. They're doing an outdoor venue. Yeah. Yeah. So the club is still closed down, but they're doing this huge outdoor venue. And this will be the first show I've done since November. Wow. So I'm going to be watching my own DVD <laughs> to see what my <laughs> jokes are. Wow. And I'll be taking notes on that. And then I'll probably improvise 90% of it like I always do anyway. Yeah, that's how you are. That's the first place I ever saw you, Helen, was at McCurdy's. I remember that. And and you're very good at speaking to the audience and, and off the cuff. I think that's what makes you so great. Well, you know, it, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I would do a regular headlining set and then I would talk to the crowd, mainly because I get distracted easily. My daughter <laughs> thinks I I have ADD. She's a psychology major. So each week I'm diagnosed with a new ailment. And... <laughs> <laughs> we've I think she's settled on ADD for one of my main uh maladies so I, I think it, one of the reasons why I talk to the crowd so much is I just get distracted my own act I've heard a million times and it bores me because yeah. it I mean it's good but yeah. if you've never heard it but if you've heard it 75,000 times even in one new joke or two new jokes in a 45 minute set wasn't enough to hold my own attention. So I would just get distracted. I would start talking to people. And then I realized that I had sort of this mentalist psychic thing going on. It's kind of hard to explain. Uh, So if you've been working in front of a crowd for 30 years, there really is only, my theory is there's only seven people in the world. (gasps) And I can recognize those seven people. Really? And so when I see one, or all of them, I see the audience and I know their whole story, all of them. Right. And I, instead of saying things like, where are you from? And are you guys married? I say, so you're married and you've been married, I'm guessing a long time. Yeah. And you don't like him. You know, I'll, I'll give, I'll tell them what's happening and it cracks them like an egg, you know, It, it opens up something. Even if I'm not technically right, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's Just brilliant. the fact that I'm calling it like I see it yeah. means that that's how everybody else in the audience is seeing it as well. Yes. Even like if they it. don't know it consciously. Yeah. The thing I've learned to do is taking that, those subconscious signals and lay them out there immediately. Is this the show you started at Coconuts? It is. It's called, I called it group therapy because I would walk up there and I just do that for an hour. And I did two of them and I started a YouTube channel and that was like March 12th. Yep. I remember. I remember. (laughs) It was, I really felt like I was onto something. And then when the pandemic hit, yeah. 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 You're starting to crank it up or you started getting to different shows. I saw the whole thing. I was at that. I don't know if I was at the first or the second show, the group therapy. But it was fun. So Helen, how do you, the, I love watching you. I love watching stand-up comedians. I always get very nervous and stressed, even though I know you're a professional, when someone starts to heckle or speak. I know you know what to do, but as an audience member, it horrifies me. So can you share with us, clearly you know how to handle a heckler. What goes on in your head when someone starts poking at you from the audience? Do you just kick them out? What do you do? Well, it so rarely happens, okay. first of all. I'd say in the last decade or so, I can't think of any time I've been heckled really except at 2016 during the election. Okay. I had some political jokes and my views were different from a member of the audience. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and I got fired actually from that gig. Because the person, obviously I win because, you know, I'm, I'm better, you know, they've, it's their first day at work. It's my 30th year. So, you know, obviously, but uh, they were like married to the guy who was the local radio guy. And then they told the, and the club owner uh, apologized for me after he pulled me from the show, sort of a knee jerk reaction. And I really kind of made the decision never to go back to that particular club again. Not that it was a bad club. I just feel like the whole reason to do stand-up is freedom of speech. Yeah. And in small ways, that's being chipped away by so many things on the right and the left. 
yes. is sort of all converging to chip yeah. away at freedom of speech. And I'm not interested in that. Right. If I, if I can't say whatever, I don't, I, I, why bother? Yes. Right. So in, in a so, funny way, people don't want to get preached at for 20 minutes, but they, they have their own political, you know, bends. And the, if you can, in a funny way, right. Talk politics, you know, shine a little light on absurdity. It, it, this wasn't even a political joke. I think it was a, I think it was something like, um, I had this bit about my daughter being half Mexican. And then I said something like, if Trump's elected, I'll have to keep her up in the attic like Anne Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that was like, a, it was like a quick side joke uh, on a bigger bit yeah. right. about my ex-husband being Mexican. Yeah. It was a bigger, and I just saying the name of a candidate right. sent this audience flying. Okay. And I just, and that was 2016. Right. So I, you know, I, I'm not, a, I'm not like Lewis Black. I'm not a political comedian. No. I don't, I, I mean, I'm only talking about my daughter. Like I've right. only, I talk <laughs> about, I don't, I'm not really political, but I guess everybody's political nowadays. Like no matter what you say, but you were asking about hecklers and yeah. it's just been so long. If I usually jump into the audience and control them from the first second I get on the okay. stage. So they're already in my narrative. And that's Got something it. that I've learned to do as I hate to bring in the female comic card, but you have to be twice as strong yeah. and control them twice as fast yeah. so that you don't leave that door open. Yeah. So that the way I establish my show is that if you say something, you, the audience already knows that I'm talking to you and I can see you. It, it really makes the people that do those pot shots from the dark. Yeah. It, it makes them impotent from okay. the minute I start the show. Okay. Uh, but, but, you know, usually it's an opportunity for the comedian, but usually it's not the most original things in the world. If, if you know, in the beginning right. of my career, when somebody would say something, you'd say something, you know, there was, you know, whatever you say, it's sort of very stock and not very, right. you know, oh, I remember fascinating. First time I had a beer, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't go to your job and slap the you oh, know, burger no. flipper out of your hand. Right. You know, those kind of, there's a million of them. I've yeah. heard yes. all of them, but yeah. you know, I, I think I'm kind of, you know, you, you eventually move beyond that okay. and you control the crowd in a different way. That so makes sense. Yeah. And I think audiences are, I don't know, do people even heckle anymore? Like, I don't, I also don't go on the road like that. Yeah. I feel like maybe I've been to too many shows in this city because I, it appears, and I don't even know now that you're saying what you're saying, if the comedians almost welcome it where I go, like the comedy cellar and different places, there seems to be a lot of heckling. It gets stopped immediately. I've seen, I've seen a lot of people get kicked out. Maybe it's just the city I live in where it's just more accepted to be gross. And, you know, people think oh, I'm in New York. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to tell this famous comedian. I've seen it a lot. Or maybe I'm just a bad luck person wherever I go. Shit falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that really surprises me that it happens a lot at the comedy. So I've worked at the comedy cellar a million moons ago, but it, it seems like that would be the worst place in the world to heckle a comedian because the people that go up there are so strong. So strong. That, but also they only get like seven minutes. So they've got to be really angry that you're ruining their only seven minutes that they're getting that night. Yeah. I've seen entire tables get kicked out. They have bodyguards that will just immediately take people out. So that's just been my personal experience. I, I probably just create yeah. that wherever I go. But um, can you tell us when you started comedy, because that's a very brave choice to make and it's just you, it's all you. What was the moment where you're like, I'm a stand-up comedian. This is who I am. This is what I do. Did you, do you remember having that moment of like, I, wow. I do actually, because I started in New York. I was an actress, actressy, you know, I'm a terrible actress, no matter what thing I was doing, I was just me saying different words. Okay. So I, it, it, but I really wanted to be, you know, somehow I knew somehow I fit in yeah. this world of show business. Yeah. And I started doing stand up, and within a year and a half, I was making a living, but I also had a waitressing job. Yeah. So I would do a pre theater. I worked across from Lincoln Center, five o'clock to eight o'clock. And then I would, after eight o'clock, I would, change my clothes, go down to the clubs that opened at 9.30, stay out till four in the morning yep. and then do it all over again. And there came a point where 
uh, Rich Hall, who used to be on Saturday Night Live, hired yep. me to open for him on a college tour. Okay. And so I really couldn't be in town to do the my waitressing job. So I had to quit. Yeah. And I remember walking into my manager's office to tell her that I was quitting because I was going to just do stand up full time. And I was absolutely terrified. I actually yeah. started crying while I was quitting yeah. because I was so grateful for this amazing job. I had all the friends I had that worked there. I actually loved this job, but, and I was all so excited about this new thing, yeah. uh, but absolutely terrified because the minute it becomes a vocation, there's a whole different amount of pressure that each joke lands. Yeah. Cause you're living your food in your mouth and your rent depend on it. So it was pretty, I mean, I definitely had a very easy transition because, you know, he, he had a private plane and would go to colleges and I'd do 15 minutes and then he'd, you know, he was a celebrity. So it was an easy, it didn't go on forever, but for that yeah. initial transition, it was pretty, it was pretty cake. <laughs> so, so were you considered funny in high school or, or college? No. I was considered someone who didn't pay attention well in class and would talk out of turn, which is different <laughs> than funny. <laughs> yeah. so then That's why, a very different you, thing. How'd you find yourself at an open mic, I'm guessing? Well, I was always a fan and I have kept a journal for years and I wrote in this journal, you know, I, I want to be a stand-up comedian. I've ever seen wow. Robin Williams do the eight, his HBO special where he wore the suspenders and he was sweating. I didn't know he was like on Coke then. I just thought he was like, look at this guy's energy. Yeah. I was very naive. And I just said, that's, that's what I want to do. I don't know why I thought that that's, that's what I wanted to do that's based great. on that performance. But I lived in New York City. I was an actor that got into a theater. Um, I was an artist in residence at the Manhattan Punchline. Nice. And Louis Black actually was there as well. Oh, and okay. it was before he was a comedian. Okay. He was at this theater company as well. And because I was an artist in residence, I could take any class for free. And I took a class on how to be a stand up comedian. Oh. And it was kind of funny because at the end of the class, we do five minutes but at, at the comic strip, but I thought we were supposed to write a new five minutes every week. So every week I'd come in with a new five minutes and wow. the teacher who I'm still friends with to this day, Gabe Abelson, who wrote for uh, on Letterman for like 20 years. Okay. Lives in LA now. And he was like, what are you, why are you doing? I thought we're, we're doing five minutes at the end. And I was like, oh, it was just me not paying attention again. Yeah. Like I thought you had to write a new five now minutes. Now it's working week. against you. It was yeah. all working against, yeah. And then I did the five minutes at the end. And then they said, you got to practice before we do our big uh, graduation thing. So I went to the Boston Comedy Club. It was my second time on stage and I won a contest. <sighs> and David Tell was the host. No way. Oh, yes, way. Nice. And uh, he thought someone else should win. And the manager of the club was like, no, it's Helen. She gets the $25. And I got another spot. And yeah. that became my home club. And I eventually, when David Tell left hosting the open mic night on Monday nights, they gave me the show. Wow. And, and that was a huge. I mean, I had so much stage time from day one because there was a woman named Jocelyn who was the manager of that club. Barry Katz owned it. And she just believed in me from yeah, day one yeah. and just gave me all the stage time. And I passed at the comic strip and I worked at New York, New York, New York. And then how old Santa are you? Around? That's are what you, it was called. Santa New York. Early 20s still? How no, old are you? I was 20. I was 29, 30 when I started oh, all right. and I'll be 59 in June. So what? Yeah. Did you say <laughs> so, 39? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, I mean, I wasn't a, like a kid when I started, I had already, you know, graduated from college. Yeah. I was already, you know, I had worked some as an actor, mostly in New York on soap operas and a little bit of commercials, but then ironically being a comedian just completely boosted my career at doing commercials because I ended up in LA and then comedians in the nineties in LA were like very, I got to deal with the Disney studios. I hosted, right. you know, six different, t you know, I hosted a show for game show network and comedy central and a and &E, and I ended up on a show on E and then, uh, I ended up touring with two other women in a theater show that was very successful. We went to Montreal with it. We yeah. had, you know, big management and, and then the band broke up, you know, we were like a band. Over a boy? Yeah. Uh, no, it was over as I drink my Starbucks. Please. There you go. <laughs> 
yeah, they're scotching that. No, uh, <laughs> I, it was over creative differences. Really, yeah. It was it was sad because we really had something going and we were ahead of our time and we were making money. Yeah. And I was Come really kind of like, what am I going to do now? And Becky, my daughter, was little. She was, she was like seven. Eight, she was like seven when we broke up and one of the women left and we got someone else who was good, but just wasn't magic. Like the chemistry of the three of us. Yeah. Right. And that's when I got the job at HSN. I was, huh. I said to my agent, I said, I want to do that. Yeah. I, they thought I was like, what are you talking about? Like, nobody yeah. wants to do that job. I was like, no, that's a great job. It's indoors with air conditioning and you're on yeah. television. <laughs> that was my yeah. only criteria, indoor air conditioning. That's yeah. pretty simple. We can make that happen. And what year did you start at HSN, Helen? 2008. Wow. August 4th, Is that 2008. Long? Yep. No. Yes. That's longer yes. than I was a host. Yes. And, Mich- and, and, and Melinda, you are on QVC guesting now, right? Because I've seen you. That's amazing. And you don't even have to go in, right? You're doing that remotely on Skype. We are doing it remotely now. Yes. I do miss going into the studio because as you know, it's just great having that contact and having someone else do your lights and your sound. Oh. I find it very stressful from home so much stress. To, to try to connect and be all, you know, when you're just sitting here in what, your house. What about doing your own hair and makeup? How has that been for you? The fucking worst. <laughs> the worst. I've definitely gone back and looked at shows. I'll have like a, you know, no one says anything, right? I'm on <laughs> yeah. the bed head. Or once I had a big a chunk of mascara fell on my face and it was there the whole, I think it was during a TSV. It was just sitting there the whole time because I don't look in a mirror. I'm just like this, this, this. So I don't like, I appreciate it. I'm so grateful that the job I have allows me to make an income, but at the same time, I miss, I really enjoy QVC. The people are, they're just lovely. They're just lovely. And I hadn't planned on doing that when I moved here, but it just, you know, just happened. (laughs) Yeah. Shit happened. So yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you, have you run into David Tell since all that happened? Because how dare he? His hash out. Since what happened? Since he decided you weren't, you didn't, you shouldn't be the winner of the contest. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Yeah. We were friends for years still yeah. to this day. I mean, yeah. I'm in touch with all those, all those people. I mean, it's not like uh, he texts, text me. I've been in touch with him to now, but I mean, I, we worked at that club together for yeah. four years. He obviously hilarious, big yeah. star, me just, you know, peeking around the, the background, but he's, uh, yeah, he was very, he was very nice to me. Yes. Actually, all the guys all, and, and women to the state people I started with, like Caroline Ray was one yes. of the first women comics I ever met. Just two years ago, I flew to LA and I did, I was a guest on her show that she did on game show network called Caroline yes. and friends. Yes. I mean, I last week I did, dim, um, I don't know if you guys know Jimmy Pardo and his podcast, never not funny. Yes. He was one of the very first podcasters and I just did his show couple weeks ago and I hadn't seen him in 15 years but it, it's uh, like you yeah. know it's there's not that many people from those core years of stand-up so yeah they all I mean I've gone to shows I used to do one of the open mics I did was uh w- me and Wanda Sykes I know she's oh, a I big celebrity her. now she came to Florida and I went to see the show and let, put a card like hey I'm here and she I they let me backstage and she was remembered me I mean comedians nice. are like the nicest that's great I think they're all super nice and and this all comes from you taking a risk at some point I'm pushing yeah. all my chips in I'm not going to do this I'm going to do this well I also this is also I think very unusual is I got an agent to book me when I really didn't have much of an act at all again uh, it was just people that were like this is what she's doing is completely different let's just right bank on it. I could be an MC right away because I was always pretty good at talking to the crowd. So I I started originally, I was making a living. I mean, I remember during the OJ Bronco chase, I was Uh in a club where I was the feature and Joe Rogan was the headliner. Wow. (laughs) So we had the same agent then, I believe. Yeah. I mean, it was Kevin James, uh, I mean, Adam Ferrara. I'm going to need an umbrella, all this name dropping. Almost, but I'm <laughs> saying is there was during this time, these people, I mean, I feel lucky that a thousand years later, I'm still making a living. That's great. Yeah. You know, I mean, did, it just. Did, did you ever, were you ever like a road comic? Or yes. was it all just Northeast? 
Well, it was <clears throat> when I was in New York, I did, you know, New Jersey, Long Island, Connecticut, you know, all the clubs everywhere. I was booked by this company in Long Island called Omnipop. I did colleges, a lot of colleges in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and then I moved to LA. I, I got a deal for the Disney studio. So I had to be in LA for auditions. And then I basically did a lot of television. And then I did sort of like, uh, I did Montreal. I've done it Montreal a couple of times, but I did, you know, sets around town at the, I was a regular at the Hollywood Improv yeah. and I worked at the Ice House. And then I would do Vegas all the time. Those are huge. Vegas, every, say- every club in Vegas, you know, Comedy Stop at the Trop, the Riviera, Wow. Uh, you name it, MGM Grant, like, and I opened for some people that That's fabulous. I opened for Bobcat a few times who I was friends with. I mean, there was just, uh, it was most, a lot of Vegas road work, but I didn't really go on the road solid until I was right. with the three blonde moms. It was four yeah. years of wow. every other weekend would be on the road, but we did wow. mostly theaters. So it was a very, yeah, and we bring, bring our kids with us. Nice. That's slappies in, in Alabama. It's, no, it, it was not. Well, we, we did the, Stardome, which wow. is it. I I don't it's somewhere in the south like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm terrible. I have no memory. No. Stardome is probably one of, the, one of the most famous comedy clubs in the country. I can't remember where it is. Now, when you say Montreal, is that the uh, Montreal the Montreal contest? Mm-hmm. No, no, no. It's the Montreal Comedy Festival. Oh, it's wow. a huge industry. Tom, <laughs> it's a huge industry thing in in Montreal. I'm Canada. waiting for my invitation. <laughs> you know, there? it's kind of changed, I think, over the years. But in the day, every network executive, every the year I went there, I had a deal with Brandon Tartikoff, who was formerly the president of NBC and then started his own production company. This is kind of a very sad story, but he had, was developing a show for me and he he died, I believe, of right. a brain tumor. He was 42, 39. Right, yeah, whatever. right. Nothing. And I was signed with him from the festival wow wow yes if that happens, i'm sorry for him dying of a brain tumor but i was also sad for myself because yeah. i was going to get my own series that's fair I <laughs> that's, that's fair just just to be fair i'm a yeah. terrible person yeah. for be, being sad for myself no. but yeah i um at the so time when you because of the life that you led you've met a lot of like so-called celebrities and famous people was there anyone that you met along the way that just you were so impressed with or that that kind of helped you that you're like well what a what a, what amazing person i'm so glad i met this person 100 percent. and i will say people like that like rich hall was the first he was famous and yeah he uh, I mean, gave me my start really a hundred percent. And also in New York city, getting me in this club and that club, it was all other comedians, famous comedians right. helping me. Well, you and, gotta bring, you gotta bring it though. You just can't be a pretty face. You've got to have material. Yes, obviously yeah. you, you wouldn't have longevity. No. I mean, I hosted a show on Comedy Central with Brian Regan and Kevin Meany. We had different co-hosts that I hosted with them and becoming friends with people like that when you're uh, I yes. was an basically an open micer I mean I had barely two jokes to rub together and I was emceeing around town yeah but uh, you can you've, you've always had the trick you've always had the capacity to engage big brain funny angle just go right and well thank you and I guess that that's kind of what I I was doing but you know I always had other priorities like when I became a mom it was really that was more a priority along the way so it wasn't like I was trying to reach for something that I, I was really just trying to support my family because sure. I was always the breadwinner, regardless of which husband I had Yeah, until now, actually my, my latest husband, I don't know if you know, I just you got landed married a, big fish. a year ago. <laughs> I married, I landed a guy with a, a job. No, Eddie, who is 12 years Eddie. younger than me, by the way, yes. uh, Congratulations. is, uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. What you doing? Are you, are you married? Are you, what do you, do you have a boyfriend? What's going on with you? No, I don't, but I'm thinking about a boyfriend. No one cares. Melinda, back to you. (laughs) No, I'm extremely single. Um, I've had the job that I've had for five years and I was traveling five days a week. I would get home Friday night, go back Sunday. So I had no opportunity other than to have flings along the way. So I'm still in my fling stage and I might stay that way. I'm more of a proponent of, um, short-term relationships seem to be better for me. <laughs> With, there's the Navy comes in regularly. Oh. Colleges are nearby. So, t- yeah, 
Tom, are you doing, how are you doing? How's the, how's the dating apps going? I'm doing great. I've, uh, I'm always, I'll, I'm always busying myself with something, this or that. This you know, I sold the ranch. I'm living with my brother, Patrick now. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. You're sold the ranch Patrick. about two months ago. And you're living with your brother? I told Patrick, I said, during this COVID, I'm going to move in with you because I want to do some traveling on the weekends. I don't want to have any animals. I don't want to have anybody. He sold the ranch. He sold, sold the ranch. ranch. I'm, living in a, I'm living in a room that I was issued this office. So I got the office going. Carry carts moving along nicely. Uh, business is good. But I just wanted, I said, I'm done with the paint and fences and the roof and all that other stuff. I did not know that. Wow, that's huge. Yeah. And I, you, I, it's, it's Wait, you I, thought during COVID, this is the time for you to start traveling? Don't you get how I the knew the end works? was coming. The end was no, coming. No, listen, this uh, boy doesn't matter if there's COVID or not. He has dated. He's he's done all the things. Nothing will stop this man. He's taught me how you date successfully during COVID. He's done Zoom calls. He has not stopped. It's like COVID doesn't exist in Tom. I got the shot now, Helen. I'm invincible. Yeah, now he has the shot. Well, so, let me ask you this, Tom. When you yes. meet a young lady, do you bring her back to your brother's basement? I mean, I don't understand like how that romance works. It's just the back seat, like usual. <laughs> You're too tall for the vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> um, you know what? I have my. <laughs> oh, uh-oh! Spill it! Spill it! You know what happened is I ended up putting the uh, my 82 inch. Remember that huge TV screen I've got in the? It, I've it's 82 yes. inch. Yes. And I couldn't give it away, so I, I said I'm going to put this in my bedroom and see if it even fits. And if it doesn't fit, I'm, I'll throw it away. <clears throat> you know, I don't want to be blind with what. It's amazing. It looks like a drive-in theater. So we're watching. <laughs> so you a lot lure of the ladies in with your drive-in theater. <laughs> I think what? what he's saying is he watches the big screen in lieu of dating. Oh, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I hope you can get the internet on your big screen. <laughs> okay, got it. It's been fun. It's been fun. Very interesting. All right. Oh, and we're, we're starting the open mic again over at Silver King on the, the end of April what is you know i have to be honest i have not done any open mics in tampa sure. i don't i'm yeah. very oblivious to that scene so steve, steve laszlo and i were doing it last year it was oh. very nice and successful until we had to shut it down you know last march like everything else and then but we're looking at the calendar says and it's an outdoor <clears throat> venue so we're going to start it up again at the end of april all right uh, i i will be willing to come by, by if you want me to i would that would be amazing <laughs> I will. You know what happens when a comedian comes to an open mic that's a headliner is all the open mics get angry because they oh. realize the minute they see you coming, they know I'm getting no stage time. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the reasons why I don't do it. Yeah, yeah. no, it'd be it'd be great. We we we've had a couple of guys come up and do t time, and it's you know fabulous. Let us establish it a little bit before we ask you to come out, so oh, okay. we'll have at least fifty to hundred people. <laughs> Oh, that was a very nice way of saying no to you, Helen. I, I heard Please, that. Helen can, Helen can knock it, can kick it off if she wants, but we may have, no. have seven people there. <laughs> no, you you get it. You let yeah. me know if you want me to yeah, buy absolutely. it. Absolutely. Oh, I believe me, I'm catching this. You, 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 Tom. You want me to wow the kids. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be because I'm sure a lot of the local open micers have never seen you. They've heard about you a little bit over at, uh, you know, on the island, but outside of that. So oh, really? let, me, let me tell you one thing that amazes me. I feel like one of the biggest opportunities that is missed by a lot of the, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, for the, for some new people You're is when I, when I was brand new, just starting out, I would sit in the comedy club for hours and watch these, you know, brilliant person. Everybody was different. And I learned so much from being in New York and watching all these people that were every single one was different. And when I'm headlining at a club and some open micer comes in and does a guest spot, they leave the minute they're done. And I don't know why they don't watch the show because it's insane. It, 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 do you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying watch me. I'm fantastic. I'm saying watch anybody. Absolutely. anybody. I can see an open micer doing his bit and then going home during an open mic. But if you've been invited to a professional show, you're nuts. Yes. Not to not to sit there and just absorb yeah. it all, or just and and Tom from the beginning, you always stayed and watched the show, and I think that's one of the reasons why you got funnier faster than a lot of your peers because you were you know figuring out how it worked because it's not like you're watching a show for a headliner to figure out oh what jokes are just to see a lot of the nuances and to see how they deal with things like what Melinda mentioned if somebody 
pipes up during your show. Or, and you I've, know, seen, just... I've seen some comics overreact and then see people react properly, you know, or make it work. Because if you crush, if you crush somebody who's just inadvertently saying something because they think it's a conversation, it's like, don't crush that person. They just, they're just being a little bit, they, you know, you're talking, right, it looks like they're talking to them. To you. They're not your enemy. Right, right. right yeah. Right. But I think all these lessons. Yes, absolutely. Are learned no. by watching, even if you watch a headliner that's terrible, yeah. you learn something. From, I've learned something from that. Like it, when I featured on the road, I stayed and watched the headliner every show. Yeah. I don't know why these people come in. They'll come in, jam themselves in, do a guest spot, and then run out to who knows where. And they never watch the show. I yeah. just don't know why. It's insane. Plus all the contacts and all the opportunities to meet the guy that's headlining, you know, after the show. And maybe he'll, because a headliner is going to be more apt to talk to a guy who did a spot than just some. Or hire you. Yeah. <laughs> or hire you. Like, uh, like yeah. working with some people that I've met, like Jeff Klein, a co- comedian who's local yeah. i thought i love jeff yeah he's i'm like oh this guy's perfect for my show i've taken him with me to i took him to vero beach with me i took i've taken him uh, you know all the shows that clubs he's wanted to get into that he couldn't get into he's that a hustler and, he, and he's also different right but what i'm saying is he it, it made the effort to Absolutely. watch the show and talk to me and <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, I and, and other people like there's other, you know, like Al Robis and Danny Bevins and all these other local headliners who are national headliners just happen to live here. Yes. When I say local headliners, that somehow takes it away from, no. you know, yeah. like they just happen to live here no, right now. <laughs> you know, they used to live other places right. and now they live in Florida. Right. Because yeah. they're tired of shoveling things. So I want to real quickly talk about your time at HSN because that's quite a trend. Oh, no, that's off the limits today, dear. I'm not finished, <laughs> We're not Tom. talking about that. Tom thinks he's the boss of me. Which I, I am the boss. Helen and I had a preview, and we're not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about HSN. All right, all right, go ahead, Melinda. What is your question uh, about HSN? It's why? such a big transition. You're the, now you're the heckler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, I'm being heckled on a podcast. Helen. It was such a big transition, I'm guessing, from what you were doing to HSN. Um, And as a guest at HSN, I understand the nuances of how stressful it can be and the pressure that the hosts have. So from from start to where you are now, how are you feeling about that? Because I feel like you came in so smoothly. I remember meeting you. I remember you walking in the door. Everybody was very excited. And I never felt like you had the bumps that a lot of the other hosts had. You seem to really transition very nicely into this. Well, because I can talk endlessly and that's okay. really <laughs> the key to everything I, I do for a living. I consider what I do in all these different, I, you know, hosting or, you know, on, on, on HSN or on standup, I'm just talking continuously. It's what I'm saying is different, but it's the idea of communicating and sharing and being authentic and saying what I'm really thinking and just being able to do that. I don't think it's any different. I don't think it's any different than, you know, if you and I, Melinda, go out for a cup of coffee. I don't differentiate those things. Yeah. So when I started at HSN, I I love to shop. I was a customer. I was a fan before I worked there. And I just sort of talked about, oh, you can't see this computer that I'm presenting. Let me tell you what I see. And then you decide if you want it. That seemed a very easy concept for me. And I just do that every time because I I am the shopper. So I get get what they want to know because I don't want to buy something unless I know everything about it, including the reviews and the, yeah. you know, like what the features are. And, and then you decide just like if I'm on stage, I'll, I know what I think is funny, but the audience, they decide what's, you know, I, I dish out my, <laughs> what I think is funny. You decide if you want to take it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Can I also say this about Helen? Cause I've seen over the, I've been in the business 30 plus years. I've seen actresses and actors come into the business as a gig. This is another gig and I'm going to pretend to be a show host. And they take some sometimes years to embrace the whole concept of you're engaging with somebody on on this shopping experience. And if you're not into that, you're handling it like a news person. It's not working. You're in You're not authentic. Whereas Helen, exactly as you described, you wanted this job. It wasn't like the the guy comes up to you and says, "Hey, we got an offer for you to go to home shopping." Oh crap! I don't want to do that shit, you know. But I got to eat, so I'm going to go do it. 
Yeah, that, that was not the experience. case. You could I tell was, that out of the box. Yeah. I, well, I was a fan and I love shopping. I mean, yeah. shopping has been something that I've always loved. It's sort of my happy place. So yeah. I've always been into retail therapy. You know, yeah. I, I, I am the person who will like, oh, I'm going to buy something and I can't wait till it gets here and then it makes me happy. And I, I understand that. And I actually felt during the pandemic that we were doing something Absolutely. that if you didn't want to watch the news, yep. watch, watch us and yep. we'll take you away and Absolutely. we'll make you, make you, you know, uh, introduce you to products you've never heard of. And, yeah. you know, maybe fantasize about getting something, Oh, maybe someday I'll get that jewelry or maybe, right. maybe today I'll get, it. you know, it, it yeah. I felt like it was, or just watch us, you know, you don't have to buy anything. We're just giving you the opportunity to watch something besides, you know, mm-hmm. the, the marathon scoreboard of how many people right. have died this week. I mean, it, it was just right. too much, too much right. for me. I know it was too much for me. I'm yeah, guessing it was too much true. for and everybody else. So about you being authentic, I think that's the other thing that I recognize with you, Helen, is at HSN, there was always a level of like, these are the hosts, don't bother the hosts, they're celebrities. And you that's came in, true. hi, I'm Helen. And you were never like that. It never felt like I, we couldn't talk to you or we couldn't have a, a, an authentic exchange on air. I never felt, Tom has felt that way, but I have never felt that way. <laughs> I, wait, what? I want to know when they made you feel like we're celebrities because I would love to be a celebrity. Oh, how, do I, how do you act like a celebrity? Please. Tom, in, click off, I'll give you a In couple. the 35 years I've been in this business. <laughs> give me an example, Tom, of a host well, you said, that you met with that was a celebrity. Oh, back in the back when I was hosting, you could knock off three guys, mostly men, thought that their shit didn't stink in the business. And I'm like, Danny, you're talking a bunch of... <laughs> people who are shopping you think you're so self-important it's it's ridiculous the ego from the tv and you're a sales guy it was it was unbelievable no yeah i i really feel like that culture doesn't exist anymore i don't see it so much with this group i don't yeah but yeah you know i was just actually talking to another host recently i feel like the group we have now is like we're all in it for the customer right really yes nice. it's a good group it is a good group. Yeah. Very, very. And I have to say, that's why I enjoy QVC so much. Cause right off the bat, everybody was welcoming. They couldn't have been nicer. They were very kind to me. And I thought, wow, this is so refreshing to be able to not feel like there's these levels of like, okay, I'll bow down to you, whatever you need. It was, it was so lovely to be able to have that kind of environment right. where I felt like we were working together. But did you ever go on campus there? Yeah, yeah, I was. Oh, you did for, get to go because I've never been there. It, I heard there, there's a Starbucks on campus, yes. and we don't have that. So that's really the my one bone to pick. Starbucks, they have a 24 hour cafe. Their cafe is attached to the studio, so you can just walk down there. There's places to nap, private rooms you can go in and nap in. When I I I was at QVC's a couple of years before the pandemic, I couldn't believe how fancy. It's a nice so, spot. I've been there a couple of times. So wow. Yeah, yeah. All right, so, we can either. We could either say goodbye to Helen or we could ask her one of the topics I was talking about before. Can I, let's finish the topic we are starting with. She said 15 minutes is all we got. Go ahead. I have questions. Uh, Go go ahead. What's your question? You're ruining the podcast. (laughs) You're ruining the podcast. We're going to break up because of Helen. I know. I feel like you guys need (laughs) like a girl. Maybe maybe your next guest should be a marriage counselor. (laughs) Tom was talking about the fact that you could possibly uh, understand what kind of a lover someone would be based on how they possibly eat a meal or dance at a party. And so I was saying my personal in my Melinda world headspace was if I saw a guy at a wedding showing off and dancing and he was a good dancer, I wouldn't think he was a good lover. I would think he's selfish because he's dancing for the crowd and not for just mm. the person he was with. And I wouldn't think he would be someone I would want to have sex with. And I want to have a woman destroy a, a rack of ribs <laughs> and not. Uh, I'm going to have to think back on this theory. All right. Uh, I will say that my husband and I I suggested before we get married that we take ballroom dancing classes because oh, nice. I used to compete in ballroom dancing when I was in high school. Nice. And it's something That's that I fun. really enjoy. Yeah. And Eddie 
as as you know tom knows him is very much a kind of like all in to try anything and we okay. ended up loving it and we were dancing at, at this wonderful place up until the pandemic of course yeah. and it became one of our hobbies and things we do is would go go out dancing that's wonderful that's yeah, wonderful so uh i think maybe your theory is right tom <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know about the men. I was asking if the women had like, oh yeah, I watched the way that he opens a door or opens a bottle or does something that is an indication of perhaps how he well, might be romantic. consideration, like yeah. being considerate yeah. is something that you want in all aspects of your life. Yeah, like if he, if he doesn't open the door for you. Uh, I'm thinking maybe the way you, you watch him do... Uh, squat thrusts or something physical might be a tell like since i was thinking i don't think i've ever seen anybody do a squat thrust since the 70s in gym class see this is why i men look at things so differently than women i i I could understand where a man would look at the way a woman dances and think oh well look how she moves her hips you know and i could see where a man would think that i think for women of course i'm gonna speak for all women here because i'm old um, I'm older than you. I just had my 60th birthday, Helen. I'm so happy you. birthday. You look We're amazing. To the grave. <laughs> you look amazing. And so as a female, what Helen said is so on the money. It's not oh. the obvious kind things he does because that's a game they can play. It's the small, subtle things. Like if he notices your, your drink is low or, you know, oh. something that's not called for that he does, then you're like, oh, you know, cause he's being thoughtful. You know, I'll give you a specific example of that. All right. When yeah. I first met Eddie, it was yeah. right before a, a, my daughter's 16th birthday. Okay. I met him in February. Her birthday was in March. So it was, bit, we only knew each other for a month. Yeah. And I was uh, with another mom throwing her a sweet 16 party. Eddie went and picked up the balloons and they got tangled up in his car. And he spent like 40 minutes untangling each balloon before he brought it in. I want to marry him. And <laughs> we, my daughter and I have an expression called eddying it up, which means you go the extra mile. There you go. <laughs> because That's he just nice. goes the extra mile for everything. That's, That's wonderful. Nice. I'm very unfamiliar with this <laughs> eddying it up. I'm so unfamiliar with this. Well, you can get an eddy. Yeah. That mean, I want an eddy. Yeah, he's pretty, he's pretty, uh, That's pretty funny. amazing. How did you guys meet? Uh, we met on match. Guys... Now, why did you groan? Because I'm taking up too much time. I'm trying to get, let Helen go about her busy day. <laughs> sorry, Helen. I'm sorry I asked you a question. That's no. okay. I forgive you. How long is this podcast? I texted <sighs> Tom. It's as long keep... as I want it to be. <laughs> I said, is this like a, a t- 20 minute pod? He goes, oh, it's 15 minutes. I said, your segment's 15 minutes. Unless Melinda has a thousand <laughs> questions about topics, which I told her not to talk about. I you know, I'm that. sorry that I'm interested in Helen. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. Melinda and I are friends and haven't seen each other for a I long know. time. We're basically yeah. catching up. This is the catch up podcast. We really are catching up. Are you going to come to Florida? Because I know you've got family here still, right? Or no? I do. Yeah. Um, I was actually there right before the, I was, um, I was at Disney the last day Disney was open before the pandemic hit because I was working in Florida. And so we decided to hit Disney because we were like, coronavirus, give me a fucking break. You know, we had no idea. So right. we were walking around Disney doing stuff. And then when we realized then, you know, it was very kind of like, oh, fuck. So um, I, I haven't been back to Florida since, you know, I've been, I've been working from home. So yes, as soon as I can safely get there, my mom just had her 82nd birthday. My sister lives there. And um, of course all my friends are there. Right. So it's always lovely. Um, it's lovely going back and, and Tom lives there. Does he? I'm not sure. Really? I don't know where he lives. So pasty. You think you'd have a little bit of sun I, once in a I while. I think Tom, you're basically homeless now. <laughs> living in someone's, <laughs> I'm living you know what? You're, this is my bed right here. Do you do you have like the original Star Trek on like a loop in that basement over there? It's I funny. mean, what what's going my, on? My sister is oddly enough. My sister today, she said to me, "Do you want me to buy this for you?" What is it? It's I a did. Star Trek DVD. Oh yeah. See, do you see Melinda? What I just did there? There's seven people in the world. <laughs> I don't want to know who I am, but I'm I believe you. <laughs> I know who you are. You're me. 
So when I see you in the audience, I know you're just like me. So I, I know exactly who you are. That's crazy. Do you, do you have any dates coming up? Do you have a, a website that we can drive people to? Yes, HelenKitty.com. And I actually did just confirm that date today for uh, McCurdy's at their out. They have an outdoor venue that they're doing. So the McCurdy's website will have it April 16th, 16th and, 17th. and 17th. I'm coming out of COVID retirement. I love it. Hey. And yes. that's for, and most and of I'm, doing I'm going to be too. doing various open mics that Tom gets me around town. Great. <laughs> that's fantastic yeah right right when they do the whole list of everybody like 100 people on the list i'm going to come in and do like 30 minutes so yes, that all those are. people will hate me we're going to go to three o'clock kids there we go <laughs> i'm not going to do that that's wonderful thanks helen thank well, you for having me i love you thank you helen i it love was you just more wonderful to see your beautiful face it's so great to see you too so i'm sure I will see you in person someday. And when I come, I'm going to come to New York at Please some point. Do. And then I will do. call you and we will I, hang out. I would love that. Thank you oh, so much. Me too. Sounds like a plan. All right. Great. Thanks, come back. Helen. Thanks, All right, Helen. Bye. Bye, Eddie. <laughs> you gotta let yourself so out now. We never finish though the dialogue. Do you is there something that women do without it being obvious that you're like, oh, she might be a really I'm telling better. you how they eat how they eat really i have to really because here's the thing i'll be honest with you again i'm gonna be maybe honest. i'm crazy maybe i'm 100 wrong when i'm in public i'm a lot better than when i'm at home i the other day i was laughing to myself because i'm alone a lot Ooh. i was eating these crackers from a bag and dip you know doing the whole oh yeah oh yeah and i thought this is hilarious i'm an animal now because who cares who cares how how i hopefully when i go in public i'll know how to eat maybe that's how i am now <laughs> you've turned into an animal have you ever been on a date where the woman was just a gross eater mm, uh, um no i haven't okay Thank that's you. good well that's good. there was that one gal that came that in one one that was really like yeah that was on the hamburger diet that yeah, one i'm on the hamburger diet that's two orders of fries please Yes. Oh. Well, we, before we wrap up our show, you and I have always uh, kind of kept up with the rowing and the treadmill. So how are you doing with the rowing? Rowing is going great. I feel like a million bucks. I've been, and it's only 10 minutes a day. You know, if you're looking for one exercise to do for 10 minutes, you could do anything for 10 minutes. A low impact. I'm rowing the hell out of it. I'm looking forward to working out. I jumped in the pool today. It was 68 degrees. <laughs> Is there a certain rowing machine you'd recommend for beginners? Like, if you know what, I'm fortunate. I have this rowing machine. I think it cost somebody a thousand bucks. Well, it didn't cost oh. me that. So it's you do have different levels of rowing machines. But is it I, how expensive they are? I had no idea. Well, Costco has one on sale right now. They've had a nice high rating for three ninety nine. They're not free, okay. but okay. You know, let me also say this. Yeah. Any type of exercise equipment, I'm on Craigslist looking for something. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's smart. That's really smart. I still recommend the treadmill. I got the flat one that's portable. I love it. I did. I was telling Tom I did two hours yesterday. I've, I'm down seven pounds. My pants are fitting different. I just feel like a whole new human. And it's given me hope because it's still cold here. It's supposed to snow again today. So crazy. where that's I great. live, it's just not easy to get out, you know, and feel. Are, are you watching something? Clearly two hours you're watching a show. Yeah, I have the remote. I watch the TV. Uh, I'll listen to audio books. I kind of flip it around because I get a little restless. But yeah, I put a movie on. Just put on a movie and watch the movie. And it's great because even though I get very sweaty, I have weights at the side of the bed. So during part of the time, I'll do my my arms because I'm so you. I'm going to have grandma. You know, I'm going to have grandma. Oh, I tell you, we all got to do a little bit of exercise. So I'm, I'm a little bit dis I'm disappointed that my Fitbit reads my rowing as swimming. Oh. So I was before when I was initially doing the rowing part way back when it yeah. would pick it up as as I was on a treadmill or, so, or on a, you know, on a incline or whatever machine. And I was getting decent results. Okay. Now it's like 10 minutes on this thing. Oh, you burned 13 calories. I was burning, <laughs> I was burning more calories cleaning out the pool, cleaning the leaves out of the pool. I was burning more calories. My gosh. And that's the other thing. I'm not a numbers person, but now I am looking at calories because I know how many I burn on the treadmill. And I look because I just, I love these caramello bars. They're chocolate bars with caramel and they're 120 calories. So now I know how long it takes me to walk if I want to burn that off. And I'm just not, I'm not drawn to them that's anymore. About, that's like, about 30 minutes. Yeah. That's 30 minutes.
minutes. Do I want to do that? So that's a weird thing. I've never been that person. And I, and I told you before, I'm mad because it's all the things people say, diet and exercise. That's actually the secret. <laughs> Plus, it's also the secret of having a nice, positive, energetic attitude. And You're right. Life, perhaps. You're right? absolutely right. I, I feel lighter and better. And I look forward to, I plan my day around, you know what, let's just jump on the treadmill now and do it now. Cause I've been doing it late at night and getting tired. And I actually, I, I get very That's excited. That's amazing. It's like when I was playing basketball, this is an exercise where I'm running like a yeah. kid. Yeah. So, well, we're going to share all the information about Helen. It was so good to see her. And now when, uh, as things get better, people can go enjoy her as well. Does she, I bet she has stuff online. I bet it would be, anybody could YouTube her, did, right? Did she say Helen Keeney comedy or did she say Helen, Helen Keeney Keeney com. 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 That's mm -hmm. wonderful. That's Helen easy. Keeney. Yeah. You know, do you remember Rich Hall from Sniglets? Of course I remember Rich Hall. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm old. I remember Rich Hall. All right. Yeah. Well, that's been a great show almost an hour darling yeah it was real. you could tell she what i wasn't letting her go i was like holding her hand and then i had to pull it because she's like okay thanks i'm like no five more questions helen i, know. Just five well, more. I knew you wanted to ask more questions i was pretending to help her out but i wanted you to ask more questions she so wanted to go and away. i wouldn't let her leave <laughs> 15 minutes i said no there's no way it's gonna be 15 minutes <laughs> She's going to curse if she'll call you afterward. Our evil plan is successful. <laughs> Just know when you're on our show, if we love you, you're going to be here for a minute. Yeah, settle in. Bring a snack. You know what? Just enjoy it. Hey, so this is, uh, we're on the weekend. This is Friday. Yeah. Are you uh, doing anything exciting? I've got no plans. Okay. All right. Oh, I've got two shows tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. I'll be in bed the rest of the day. Okay, so your shows are, are they all for the um... long arm pruner? And I'm also introducing a new product, which I'm excited about. You know, I was not much of a, of a veggie guy or a grow my own stuff guy. I mean, I lived on a ranch. I grew yeah. something once something, right? Yeah. Then Amy Petroselli invited me to be the on-air guest for the tomato tower, right? So I go to Costco and I go get some, you know, pre-growing tomatoes, stick it in the tower. It's like, Oh my God, these tomatoes are amazing. I'm eating the fresh tomatoes that I'm growing versus something I'm buying at a supermarket, which looks red, but they taste like, you know, not that homegrown tomatoes are amazing. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'm liking this. And so she said, oh, we're going to do a veggie garden next. So yeah, bring it out. So I bought peppers and tomatoes. And so I'll be selling this veggie garden thing. I'm excited about it. You oh, self water because I'm, I'm horrible with watering stuff. So okay. Very exciting. Both your shows are during the 7 a.m. hour at HSN. Back to back. Last two items of the hour. Very exciting. All right. Well, well um, I'm Melinda McKenzie. And I'm Tom Wise. <laughs> thank you for unpacking some shit. And we will see you on Monday. Yeah. Thank you. That's another one that can't. And thanks for Helen Kinney for joining us, making the show. All hail Helen. That's right. And, and we're out. Have a good weekend. <laughs>